Hi, everyone, and welcome to Health Watch. I'm your host, Carolyn Wilson from Ledgelight Health District. The goal of this program is to bring you information on a wide range of interesting health topics and introduce you to the great people doing important work all over the community. Today, I'm joined by Ruth Kenobi, the Director of Ad Advocacy for the American Lung Association in Connecticut. Ruth, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So Ruth, um, tell us how long that you've been at the Lung Association and about the important work that you do there. Great, so um, I've been with the Lung Association in Connecticut for um, it's almost nine years. I think next week will be my nine year anniversary with the Lung Association. Um, and so I started out doing some um, work around peer tobacco prevention work under a grant. And then um, some oppor other opportunities opened up. And so now I've moved into kind of, kind of the advocacy realm. And so it means I get to do like great community building and relationship work um, and education, but then also trying to influence um, broader policy change on the state, um, local, state, and national level. So it's, it's pretty exciting. That's amazing, that's great. Sounds like it's right up my alley too. <laughs> um, is there anything in particular that got you um, involved with the Lung Association? Um, a few things. Um, I mean, I, I had an uncle who passed away from lung cancer. He was very dear to me and I lost him way too young. Um, I was in, in college and, and around that same time, I was kind of introduced to some social and health justice issues. And I remember one thing in particular, um, kind of learning about how many people um, didn't have access to health care. And I, it just kind of blew my mind and um, realized, okay, this is something I kind of want to get involved in. And um, eventually pursued my MPH, Master of Public Health. And um, one thing that the Lung Association mentions often that really resonates with me, it's kind of like, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And so like with a public health degree, it just kind of really um, fits very well with some passions and um, feeling like it can make a difference. Absolutely, I can, I can relate to that 100%. So um, tell us a little bit about the Lung Association in general. Uh, what's the mission of the organization? Yeah, and so the Lung Association is a voluntary health organization. It's been around for over a century now. Um, and our mission really is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. And we look at that kind of through different lenses being research, education, and advocacy. And so we kind of divide some of that up in what's called four strategic imperatives. And so the first one is to defeat lung cancer. Um, the second is to champion clean air for all. So not only the health of our lungs, but kind of what's going into them um, to improve the quality of life for people impacted lung, by lung disease and their families. And then lastly, to, complete, um, to create a tobacco-free future. So it's big, um, grand goals, but um, that's kind of the vision and, and the, how we frame the work that we're doing and decide what we get involved in. That's amazing. Talk about public health in action. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so let's talk about the big issue that's going on right now. Um, everyone's talking about, I know we did a couple of episodes of Health Watch just talking about this issue, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, what, we know that it's considered a respiratory virus. Um, what do we know and what do we not know about the virus? And, and what is the yeah. Lung Association doing um, right. in regards to it? So, I mean, sure, right, the, the Lung Association, as soon as this is coming up, it's definitely apropos, right? So, I mean, COVID-19, it's a respiratory illness caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, and so, and it's a new virus to humans. One thing, some things that we know is that everyone's at risk for getting the virus, but um, what is different is kind of what we're predisposed to and how we can react to it and what our outcomes can be, right? And so while everyone can get it, people with serious underlying health conditions are at greater risk for worse outcomes with that. So the things that I'm sure you've covered on this is how important it is to wear a mask, wash your hands, um, practice social distancing, those kinds of things are so important. Um, and we know that I mean, the Lung Association is really trying to do our best around 
promoting good science-based data out there because it has changed, right? In early March, it was like, don't wear masks. And now it's like, okay, the science is there. We should be wearing them. Um, and so in the spring, we did announce that uh, kind of COVID-19 action initiative. Um, it's an investment of $25 million towards addressing COVID-19, as well as kind of building networks against um, future respiratory epidemics or pandemics. And so that's a big um, initiative that we're working towards. And we offered a number of resources. So if anyone's interested, kind of our lung.org website has a wealth of information, including town halls and different um, resources and webcasts about with healthcare professionals and those kinds of things to try to get good information about even things like how it's impacting our mental health and how um, it's um, air quality can impact our risk. So um, hopefully if, if people want more, there is a lot on our website um, and a lot of um, resources available for folks who do um, want some more data. That's terrific. Yeah, I mean, talk about a crazy year we've had so far with this um, on top of all the other important initiatives that the Lung Association addresses. Uh, how about that curveball, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, I before this, we were talking a little bit, and uh, I told you that you know, one of my other hats that I wear is a prevention coordinator, mm -hmm. and we're always talking about prevention. Yes. And so one of the interesting things that you and I have in common are our concern with vaping. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly a hot topic and um, curious to know what the latest is that you're hearing. Um, we've been hearing a lot about lung injury associated with vaping and are there anything, any programs coming down the pike you want us to know about? Yeah, no, great question. And so, I mean, I'll be very curious to see how um, times with the pandemic have impacted um, people's tobacco use rates. I think it's something that we'll, we'll look at when we have that data, but um, right, stress is going up, but maybe for young people, is access going down? Well, it will be really interesting and, and we'll certainly be paying attention to that. Um, numbers are coming out pretty regularly about kind of youth use. I know the most recent number that I saw for Connecticut high school students was that 27% in a month's time were using electronic cigarettes. Um, and it's concerning and it's a trend that we're seeing throughout the country. And um, we definitely want to be doing more to kind of change lots of the perceptions around, oh, these are safe products that people are using to help quit. Um, there's a lot of bad information about these products. And so we're trying to do more around that. In fact, this week, it really worked out well that we're having this conversation is um, the Lung Association introduced the kind of what's called the End the Epidemic campaign. And so it's a four-pronged approach of trying to address the vaping epidemic, which everybody was talking about a year ago. Um, and sometimes I can't wrap my brain around the fact that that was this time last year. Um, but one thing is that we partnered with the Ad Council nationally to do um, a campaign called Get Your Head Out of the Cloud. Um, and it's really aimed at parents and giving them the tools and resources that they need to talk to their young people in their lives that they care about. Um, not at high school age where they're already exposed to some of this, sadly, but like if they're 10 to 14, um, that's kind of the, the target range of just giving them the tools to to ask about this, are you seeing this? This is not something we value. Um, and and um, how, helping parents have a, a resource there. Um, and then we also have two programs that are for schools. Um, the in-depth program is an alternative to suspension um, program. So young people who are caught using these products, um, trying to give them tools and information to combat lots of the marketing that they're seeing instead of just suspending them and you know going that, that route. And we also have um, a program called NOT, which is not on tobacco for young people that's just been um, revamped to include kind of the, the changing landscape of tobacco products. And that's um, a voluntary cessation program for young people. Then we'll be doing lots of advocacy around trying to reduce um, you know, access to these products. And we also made an investment in kind of a research project around um, how these products will impact people long-term. Cause that's the other thing that people often don't talk about is, you know, 
now 50 years later after the Surgeon General's report about how cigarettes impact our bodies, we're still finding new things out. And the electronic cigarettes have been on the market for just over a decade and they've changed a lot in that time. So um, trying to just find more about how those products really impact us long-term. Boy, there's a lot on the, on the education front. <laughs> that was a lot. Sure. <laughs> and, and I'm in the thick of it just as the Lung Association is. Absolutely. Um, I hear from schools all the time trying to figure out how to handle this and the best practices. And I'm thrilled to hear about the, um, the, the suspension alternative. Yes. Yeah, we're hopeful that it, it, it's it's useful and um, and that young people can get something out of it, but schools have a tool as well because, I mean, it's hard. You talk to the administrators and they'll show you the box of things that they've confiscated. Um, but yeah, we want to um, give people tools to, to make changes and so that they're not addicted to these um, products that causes, you know, that contain a significant amount of nicotine. Right. So, so important. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think it's a good time to take a little bit of a break. Um, for everyone who's out there watching, please stay tuned and we'll be right back. Meet the scan, a simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. but I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at savedbythescan.org. You're the engine that makes all things go. And you're always in disguise, my hero. I see your light in the dark. Smile in my face when we all know it's hard. You're doing a good job, a good job. You're doing a good job, don't get too down. The world needs you now. Know that you matter, matter. Welcome back to Health Watch. I am joined today by Ruth Kenobi from the American Lung. Association of Connecticut, and uh, we've been talking about all things lung health. So right before the break, we were talking about vaping. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about another thing that you and I have in common. Another hat that I wear is tobacco cessation. Great. And um, tell us what's going on right now for the Lung Association and tobacco cessation. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we talk about these issues and, and you know, we're always, we're never anti-smoker, it's anti-smoking, and we want to make sure that people have the tools to quit. It's really important. And so we have a couple of resources, but we're always happy to share. And I know there's a lot of great work being done in Connecticut um, as well. And so we have a program called Freedom from Smoking that people can access online. Um, or sometimes there's people at hospitals and other community organizations throughout the state who have been trained as um, freedom from smoking facilitators and run groups um, trying to help people quit. Um, the Lung Association also has a um, lung helpline, which isn't just for um, smoking cessation, but that's one of the options that's available. But generally, if anybody has any questions about lung health, um, they can call, ask about radon, ask about lung cancer, asthma, a variety of um, topics. And if um, the healthcare professional can't answer that for some reason, they'll connect with the right person. Um, and that's 1-800-LUNG-USA. Um, and so that's another option that people have. We always promote the quit line that's available, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, and there are another, like a number of other texts to quit reminders and those types of things that we're seeing that are trying to address some of the young people who are using these products as well. Um, but there's there's a lot going on and there are resources out there, um, but those are kind of the, the Freedom From Smoking, 1-800-LUNG-USA and 1-800-QUIT-NOW um, are some places that we suggest people to start. Um, and then the healthcare professional as well, because you know if <laughs> healthcare professionals know us 
often um, well. And so if it's just kind of having that conversation of where to start, because there are options, but um, you know, counseling is a good option. There are um, pharmacotherapy options as well, but again, that's a healthcare provider conversation. Um, but those, the ones that are approved by the FDA, not electronic cigarettes, those are not an approved cessation device. Um, yeah, so I would say those, those are the big pieces. So, so important. There are so many options for people now. Um, we hope that healthcare providers are asking their patients. Yes, about, very uh, much. If they are interested in quitting every time. Yes. And um, basically what I tell people and, you know, never stop trying, you know. No. No, the, one of the things that amazes me is it's kind of, I think the average times that it takes somebody to quit is seven times to be, you know, successful. And I think people can be um, a little bit, dis, you know, discouraged if they're not successful right off the bat, but it's like, no, you took that step. It might be a setback, but keep trying, I think is really important. Right. You learn something yeah. new with every attempt. Yes. Great. So um, on that same topic, but slightly different. Um, tobacco advocacy. So it's been a pretty big year. Um, a major milestone has been the Tobacco 21 uh, mm -hmm. legislation. Can you give us an update on some of those policy efforts um, that we're seeing regionally and nationwide? Yeah. So Tobacco 21 was a really um, exciting win. It was something we worked on for four to five years um, on the state level, and we saw some um, you know, states around us pop up, but um, 2019 was a big year. Um, and so we were one of, I think, close to 14 or 15 states that passed it in the country. And then actually it became law of the land on the federal level. And so now um, the legal age of, of sale of tobacco is 21. So that was really exciting to be part of that movement. And our hope is, you know, really to get those products out of the high schools um, and, and do some big prevention. Cause we know that most adults who smoke or use tobacco started way before that age. And so um, trying to just intervene early is so important. Um, some other things that we're working on is addressing flavors, um, products like cotton candy, gummy bear, um, all of those types of things are real draws for young people. And one of the main reasons that young people cite for trying. Um, and so uh, Massachusetts and California just this week um, passed a law about um, prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco products, all tobacco products, which is exciting and can, is promising practice. Um, and then our neighbors, Rhode Island and New York and New Jersey, all have um, limits on um, or pro prohibitions of flavored tobacco or flavored electronic cigarette devices as well. So our neighbors are moving that route um, and we're, we're pushing that. And we thought there was promise this year, but with everything in the state legislature kind of getting derailed, um, we're, we're looking at that again for the coming year. That's so wonderful. I, uh, I remember speaking on the local level about that issue. And sometimes I think we're seeing with policies of starting on the local level and then it's- I'm so glad you said that. Cause I think that's one of the main reasons we got somewhere in Connecticut. I mean, we saw some wonderful leadership by cities and towns throughout the state passing that law on the local level, kind of letting um, state lawmakers know that this is something that um, people throughout the, the state really wanted to see and helping to protect and promote public health in their um, communities. Yes, huge win all around yes, for sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so you need air to breathe. You do. Lungs. Yes. Are for breathing. So let's talk about air for a second. Yeah. Um, what's, what's on the horizon for healthy air, clean air, what's going on with that? Yeah, so um, healthy air, clean air, or, you know, we've been paying attention to it for a while. Um, just in April, we released our 20th anniversary state of the air report, where it looks at kind of ozone pollution and particulate matter pollution throughout the country. And Connecticut surprisingly does not do all that well um, in regards to ozone pollution. I think people are sometimes surprised, um, but unfortunately we get a lot of um, pollution from our neighboring states and weather patterns bring it there. So it's something that we really pay attention to because because people who kind of are have lung health issues can really be at risk for um, poor health outcomes on those um, days, be it lung health or 
um, frankly, heart, heart um, issues as well. But so it's something we pay attention to. We just released um, this summer a program called Stand Up for Clean Air. Um, we were part of releasing um, a, a, a really great um, film as part of a film festival called Unbreathable that talks about um, clean air as well as how that impacts. Um, it's an environmental justice issue, justice issue um, and trying to encourage people, more people to kind of share their stories around how healthy air, clean air, or air pollution impacts their health. And so it's called Stand Up for Clean Air. Encourage people to, to take a look and take a stand. I will definitely be checking that out. That sounds really interesting. Great. So um, unfortunately, we can't talk about lungs and lung health without talking about lung cancer. Yeah. Um, what What's going on um, right now in terms of programming for that? Um, we're... At the Lung Association, I think it was about five or six years ago, we released, re launched something called Lung Force. And it was really an effort aimed at trying to raise awareness that lung cancer is the number or the leading cancer killer of men and women in the country. And I think it's something that lots of people are surprised by. It's not just, I mean, we'll often say that whatever cancer is impacting you or your lung cancer, your loved one is the, the worst one, right? But, um, it's something that I think a lot of people don't have on top of mind. It's like, oh, I didn't smoke or, you know, whatever. There's a lot of, or I've, I quit forever ago. And so we're just trying to do a lot around reducing stigma associated with lung cancer. Um, unfortunately, some people have to deal with, well, you know, they get the diagnosis and on top of that, well, did you smoke? And it's like, well, anyone who smoke, you know, anyone with lungs can get lung cancer. And uh, like we said, people start really early and it's a very addictive issue. And so um, trying to just raise awareness, raise funds, um, advocate for um, better research, better treatments, um, those types of things. But it's, um, it's a really great campaign that we have and just trying to um, do more around that and, and get better treatments for people because for so long, it really was a, a dire diagnosis and prognosis, but we're seeing a lot of improvement really in the last five or six years. That's good, good news. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> relating to that, um, all of the research that's needed and all the advocacy, um, fundraising and campaigning. Yeah. Um, I know that I have done one of the stair climbs before. It was mm -hmm. very hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Talk about checking your lungs. Um, what else is going on to help the health of the Lung Association right now? Yeah, and it's such a strange time. We've had to change some of those events, right? And so April, we were planning to have our um, Hartford Fight for Air climb, which is, it's a pretty fun event where we have people climb up um, 30 something flights of stairs. And then we get firefighters there who also compete against each other and they put their whole gear on and do the whole thing, which is an impressive feat. Um, and so, and we also were scheduled to have our lung force walk in um, early June, which again, so we moved those to virtual events and people could participate that way. And we're um, working to figure out how we can make those kind of meaningful community events that people can um, bond and um, learn more about the Lung Association and connect with people who um, care about our mission. Um, and so there's, more to come. People can always go to our website and donate. Um, it, it was a hit not being able to have those in-person events, I think. Um, and so many people, I think so many organizations, like so many people in this time are, are struggling. So um, any donations are appreciated. Um, and and I, I am hopeful that we'll be able to be creative as we look forward. I think next year, there's some talks about doing some more outside events and figuring out ways to um, make that something that we can do and, and gather people in a um, responsible and healthy way. Wow, very important work for sure. Um, lastly, um, real quick, tell me about the most rewarding part of your career in a nutshell. Hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's there's a couple, but I'll, I'll do real quick. Um, one, I think the win of Tobacco 21 was a uh, a really exciting thing. Oftentimes we do a lot of work building community and engagement and trying to make a difference. And so kind of seeing a law that we've worked hard on for many years actually get passed. Um, personally, professionally felt really um, good. And then I, I mean, my job is always different all the time. And I like um, interacting and getting to know people throughout Connecticut is um, 
also something that's pretty rewarding and, and a good opportunity to, to get to know lots of people from all different backgrounds. That's amazing. Ruth, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I've learned a lot. I know our viewers have too. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for you know providing this opportunity. It's really nice to talk with you. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We'll catch you right back here next time on Health Watch.